that was such a beautiful introduction. And thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, I want to thank the English department and the creative writing program, and especially Justin and Sally. <laughs> Thanks for the tip. Right? Um, yeah, and Cecilia, thanks for uh, navigating the discussion yesterday. And Erin, um, thank you so much for that wonderful intro. Um, I'll be reading most of them now in color today and then a few new poems. Um, and uh, like Erin shared, it sort of explores my Mexican-American heritage. It's sort of interwoven with um, some Spanish lesson poems, uh, which I'll start with, and um, sort of looks at film as a way to sort of speak through um, kind of the history of my family moving up until this point. So, let's see. Esperanza. Es Per ansa, noun, feminine. Migration is written on this green heartache of home, once its own discovery of water. The Aztecs met Sleekslikliko, meaning place in the center of the moon. Some are used to hopes being where they've been, but singing one octave is Kansas to Oz. For a while, my father didn't know that the movie changed to Technicolor since the family TV was black and white. Uh, Mexico as Mexico 1914. And this piece was sort of written after some research I did uh, to discover that um, while the Mexican Revolution was going on, the time in which my ancestors came into this country, there was also the development of film happening. and. Um, you know, documentarians and also movie sort of, I guess, uh, those who create films, <laughs> maybe for fictional films, were going down and filming the battle scenes and actually came to an agreement with Pancho Villa to film some of the battles. Uh, but they weren't able to sort of get as close to the shots as they would like um, and ended up coming back to sets in the US uh, to sort of create narratives around these, get close ups, and sort of reenact scenes earlier on. Uh, so this one's called Mexico as Mexico, 1914. Mexican soldiers of the Revolucion play their shades through Hollywood cameras. Gray, charcoal, ash, slate for the life of General Villa. Except the bullets are real and there's nothing special about effects. Battles set during daylight mean you can see when a man falls, the orchestra moves on without him. In one recovered reel, a rag threads through the shrapnel hole in someone's leg. In others, the backstory filmed in California where a young Villa rears a trick horse, spinning the way it will in birth of a nation. The rest melts to silver drops, but you're asking for one quarter of my blood and for a footfall on the southern border. Before my father was born and my grandfather too, before his, fam before his father worked in the shipyards and in the orchards, and for someone who looks like me but isn't. You must rewind this place to know. It was post the outlaw's revenge, post the raid on Columbus, New Mexico, 1916, when the original footage was recast as hero turned bandit. And somewhere between here and Satevo, my ancestors escape the way steam rises from fire. Relato. Relato. Noun, feminine. Fragments underwater and distant gleam like starfish, sure to dry into brittle, pale selves. I've learned to collect what's scattered, learn to set them here on the chance odd ends whisper. My grandfather served in the Merchant Marines, and um, I conducted several interviews with him uh, to write some of the poems here. And he appears on the book cover as the boy in the photo. Um, and this one's called Santa Catalina, which is an island um, off the coast of California, or Catalina Island. When the wealthy flee Catalina, you move in, along with the anti-aircraft guns, observation towers. Still, the buffalo brought for a movie they were never in go on living their lives. 
No one's worried that after so many reinventions, the island might finally roll over and swim away. Feral cats roam its city, feral goats the sunny brush. From excavation, remnants of fishers and traders signal they too paddled to its shores. Now you learn to unload cargo in the harbor. Others not trousers for use as flotation, and maybe this will save them from the deep curtain of kelp, its flickers of light and gaping chasm. I learn some hotel rooms were converted to barracks, but you say you were in a wooden hut with three others and never swam through inflamed water. In that hut, sunk in the shadows of early winter, the four of you listen to murmurs and light footsteps on damp leaves. One fellow asks, what are you? He means, why are you brown? He says, aren't you ashamed of it? And this piece, I have a memory I wrote while I was here. This book was sort of largely written during my MFA time here at ASU. And I read this at, I think, my first MFA reading. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of come full, full circle tonight. Ulithi, which is this little island um, in the Western Pacific. And you can't really see it unless you like, really zoom in on Google Maps. So it like looks like it's not there until it is. Ulithi. You enjoyed being nowhere, how men were equally small against the merchant ships, small against the Western Pacific. Front lines you thought dissolved like salt, salt water to rinse a sore throat. Back and forth, mariners moved with the cargo, though some navy called you riffraff, draft dodgers. Picture gray masses anchored beneath sun, battle wagons, your cargo vessel, it was beach day. You'd finished wiping your rag over table rims. Ulithi suffered paradise. The islands, the guns. Over the phone, Ulithi sounded like Ulysses. Marred by the water, the fish like shrapnel confetti. Below, an oil tanker sunk in the shallows. Cracked, twisted, a stunned giant. From satellite mapping, Ulithi's lagoon and islands dotting the rim of an undersea volcano are invisible, such that you might still be drinking those two warm beers, might still be 18 looking down through clear water. Um, this next piece uh, called Fragmented Apology 2006, and it's after the California Senate Bill 670 enacting the Apology Act for the 1930s Mexican Repatriation Program, which was actually nationwide and involved the forced deportation of, over, of two million people of Mexican ancestry, many of whom were American citizens. Um, although I believe California is the only one to make a formal apology. Fragmented Apology, 2006. When the knocking comes, county agents are on the porch telling Mexicans you should go in two weeks. Here are the tickets. Here's your destination. In raids, hundreds at La Placida Park detained for papers, vans idling in the peripheries while their children at school wait. And threats for some families are real enough to leave. How can this be called voluntary? As a heartbreak? As a life packed and thrown across the hills? Who knew and said nothing, and still says nothing? Who went turning off the house lights because no one was home? Imagine the people in the train car, the girl whispering the moon is following her to the make-believe town become real, become vacant looks on her parents' eyes. In reflection, a little oasis of nothing. And you, lucky to know someone or not, some can speak the language or can't. One woman must paint her belonging until there's a bridge and in the distance, a steeple. Rueda, Rueda, noun, feminine. 
To make pinwheels and paper rosettes, I'm told to begin with squares and rectangles, folding edges into the center. They spin as if they've forgotten this origin of steps. We too forget our feet. Um, so an interest of sort of movie stars, and especially the movie stars sort of of the 1930s and 40s, um, are kind of of interest here, and especially um, how they serve not only as sort of examples of beauty, but like examples of assimilation too. Uh, study of self-portrait. I hate that I love transformation montages. The Arctic fox sheds its brown fur for the winter promise, testing the snow it dives again and again to color beneath. Here is before, here fast forwarding to the smile. The actress fills in her brows. She is the artist and the canvas enough to select a new name. We hope we're all as pretty underneath, all American sweethearts. And then do most stop asking, where, 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 soft sirens, are you from? Rita Hayworth never televises her first true makeover. Neither does she pick her name like a fruit. She revises it to her mother's, adding a Y for sounds always intended. Rewind to Margarito Carmen Consigno. Imagine editing yourself. Reconcile that after a hit, they'll still place you in B movies. That after marrying a prince, you'll still be lonely in crowds. Or rewind to the queen of Technicolor's Maria Africa Gracia Vidal. Remain, become, remain, become, remain, become. Let's see. I guess we'll do one with the queen of, queen of Technicolor. Queen of Technicolor in 1943. My grandmother is 15, entranced by color. Islanders paddle to, shore, paddle to shore with loads of papaya, the ocean sweeping the sand, spilling from the screen, all eyes ahead. It's Maria Montez, this time royalty in plumeria headdress. Yellow, coral, violet bloom around her and in her. My grandmother's family changes the spelling of their last name to match. Montez to Montez, mountains to mountains. Part of the giantess exists in her. And it's true, it's Celia Montez like the movie star. Montez, the queen of Technicolor, is always in love, or in the moment right before being in love. With a stern face, my grandmother's mama tells her, the queen is not serving her husband enchiladas and beans. She is not telling her children to pray. My grandmother doesn't care. Montez's sleepy eyes call the audience in, and this is her secret. If you were like her, a princess in the tropics, a Persian queen, cobra woman, you'd be in love too, or about to be. For my grandmother, the hum of her Spanish accent under the English words is the fisherman's line in the meat cute. She, like Montez, is home in a paradise from which all colors illumine. Sent forth on waves to the shore, to the promenade, to the dance hall, where girls like her wait for their stories to end in a kiss. She will know what happens soon enough when at 19, my grandmother will marry Enrique, her last name disappearing in those starry children chasing one another through their Anaheim motel. She will outlive Montez, who dies in her reducing bath at 39. And she will say her father's name to herself, Pedro Montez, will recall his singing De Colores on the local radio. See, I think I'm gonna jump ahead. And uh, this is an ekphrastic poem, so a poem responding to art, and in this case, a photograph of um, Melanie Griffith with a lion in her home. Um, Melanie is a teenager at the time. Her mother, Tippi Hendren, uh, is a famous movie star. They really both are. And they were preparing for the film called Roar, which ended up being quite a flop, but it involved like over 30 big cats on set. 
terrible idea. It was like, you know, the Tiger King before Tiger King. Um, and essentially, part of the preparation was getting to be comfortable around these cats in like, I don't know, a domestic setting. So the advice was, we're gonna bring these cats to sort of live at your mansion with you. Uh, and a photographer came one day to take these photographs. Um, you know, obviously don't do this at home. <laughs> uh, it's called In Bed with the Lion, which is this particular photograph of sort of Melanie next to this lion that's sort of covered by this blanket. And it's sort of at an angle where you can't quite tell, like, is that is that a lion? Um, it's worth looking up. <laughs> OK. Uh, In Bed with the Lion. They sleep, each covered by the red blanket. Lion's tail plumes out from under like the thick cord of a church bell. Or they are awake, watching each other be still. They compare hair and nails against the rosebud print of the sheets. Or they are pretending to sleep, one hiding from her mother, one from its nature which has never left. They lie quiet as if dead. Or one is awake, watching the other sleep, considering the live-in trainer's request that mother, daughter, and lion use their inside voices. Or they are waiting for the photographer, waiting for the pool where she can pull lion's paws through her wet hair like a heavy brush. Or since the lion is apparently named Neil, they like to believe in a world that would allow such things. Hablar, hablar, verb. The parrot chooses not to speak or say so when tired of teaching it. Keep a room for only that language. Place the birdcage inside the room. Whistle and coo, find the parrot teaching you. Um, this poem was written sort of in the time when I was deciding whether or not to keep my last name. And so it kind of, I don't know, it was something growing up, I guess as a girl or as a woman, that I always had thought about giving away, um, which I ended up keeping eventually. But at the time, it was sort of really thinking about it um, before I got married. And it's called Valentine to the Disappeared. Dearest. The hum of a hundred years finds you in the divided flesh of an orange, tracing you back to northern Chihuahua. Once wealthy ancestors are now a caricature of large heads and long legs. They say, even on horses, their feet dragged on the ground. After the revolution, you belonged to fruit pickers, grocers, motel owners. Now there's a judge, a professor, less chihuahua. Some of us have forgotten how to speak with those dead, which means a boy made to feel ashamed in his learning the language will not learn. He cannot teach his daughters. Now the feeling returns in me for not knowing the words. I am told half of you means bucket, balde, the other branch, rama, water for grafted trees. I call you little name because you turn invisible in new mouths, have been spoken by so many you can't be heard anymore. Little name, as myself, I've always been ready to send you away like a nutshell boat weighted down by a pebble into dry stream beds. It is like that with anything built to be given. And I'll do one more poem from this book and then a couple new ones. This one's called uh, Cancion de Cuna, a lullaby for children affected by the 2018 zero tolerance policy. Outside, past the ceiling, la luna lunera shines up and down the long dark road. There, the tails of frogs begin to disappear with the hum, sana, sana, colita de rana. And there, the chicks in the cold are saying, pew, pew, pew. There, the branches of wild plums let fall their small fruits for crickets and a hungry mouse. And there, somewhere, your mother is singing to you. Aruru and good night and prayers on the rosary of her fingertips. 
Nuestra Señora de las Lagrimas, Our Lady of Tears, may we all grow a little more by daylight, as does the olive, as does the orchard. Okay, so a few new poems. Um, my next manuscript is sort of dealing with more environmental themes and monsters, both sort of mythical and uh, film monsters, and I think these ones are more mythical or mythological. <laughs> Cyclops Pastoral. When the moon goes out, the eye socket is a buttonhole with no pearl. I am not lonely inside and outside this sleeve. Warmth rises again, and the flock shivers past my fingers. Despite what they say, the world comes toward my outstretched hand. The dark garden suddenly touches back. Earthworms know of birds hopping near, or a hand shovel, over a footstep, me too. The slight tremble announces itself softly to anyone listening. Sweet grass, the buzz of a wasp returning to her nest to watch out. The waves on the shore, like all distant fathers, doors opening and closing. I have eaten all I can for years. Now a garden keeps within me. Last week's sheep, the dew of honeysuckle, the water which in drinking wakes a spring. Camera trap. Uh, my sister had an internship where she was sort of setting cameras, like motion detect detector cameras. And my question to her was like, do those go off like if sort of a branch moves? And essentially like her question was yes. And she had to sort of go through all the footage at the end of the week or, or however long she collected sort of the samples and the data and go through and watch these um, camera trap films. Camera trap. My sister's eyes line the mountainside and return telling of visions. Snowfall and waving branches, a hundred such stories of setting and no character, until the shape of a bear, led by a small reflective orb, pauses, then walks on amidst flitting bugs. Unlike the eyes of Argus, she sent hers out like spider web, hooked to trees and speaks of false catches, then smatters of mule deer and raccoons, an assortment of birds, and a flattering clips of herself crawling out from under manzanita and chaparral. In town, similar eyes watch us on the boundary. At checkout, I see myself on a video screen looking away like one of my sister's disinterested creatures. Who do we seem to be, here or in some grainy blur that scoops our figures from overhead and tells us to smile? My sister's my sister looks to shape and tail for identification and gets hung up on the indistinguishable. For years, we mistakenly called the backyard tree a blue spruce. For years, I've learned how difficult it is to spot a distant bird and give it a name. And I will finish um, with this little poem, which is called White Lined Sphinx Moth. And these are in Utah, but <laughs> Maybe if you have any big moths here, you might see them, but they can be easily sort of mistaken for hummingbirds. They are so large. Um, White-lined sphinx moth. It riddles only in the confusion of its body. Humming as a tiny bird accounts the tubulars. We dip our cups into our sinks as well, expecting always to drink sweet water. In photos fast enough to still it, the sphinx, striped orange, black, and white, is more tiger than bird. It's not small, just far away, moving in and out of shadow, wings growling as we pass the small back roads into the neighborhoods of the city. Thank you so much. <laughs>